Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's RBC Lunch and Learn uh, hosted by the J. Herbert Spitz Center. Uh, I'm your host, Jade, and today we have joining us Dr. Maddie Hosseini. Uh, so Maddie is the latest member of uh, the J. Herbert Spitz Center. He is an assistant professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering with a joint appointment uh, here at the center. Uh, Maddie has received his BSc, MSc, MASc, and PhD in electrical engineering from the University of Tabriz uh, in the University of Tehran. Uh, uh, excuse me here. Uh, University of Tehran, University of Waterloo, and the University of Toronto in 2004, 2007, 2010, and 2015, respectively. From 2016 to his start at UNB, Dr. Hosseini served as a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Toronto in joint collaboration with Huron Digital Pathology. There, he investigated uh, image analytic solutions in digital pathology for improvement of image quality scans in whole slide imaging and artificial intelligence and machine learning applied in computational pathology for development of computer-aided diagnosis systems in clinical pathology. So I'm gonna bring Maddie here onto the stage and uh, he can tell us a bit more about himself. Hello, Maddie. Hi, how are you, Jade? Not bad, and yourself? I'm doing good, thank you. Thanks awesome. for inviting me. Uh, not a problem. So you have a presentation, is it ready to go? Yes, I believe so. All right, so I will pull your presentation up right now here, and I you have the full stage. It's all you, and I'm just in the background. So if you need anything from me, just I'm right there. Okay, thank you so much. Hi everyone, um, and thanks for uh, joining my presentation. Uh, so today I'd like to actually talk about the data science of computational pathology. Um, so the outlines of my presentation actually uh, it, it covers into three topics. The first, I'd like to actually go over like the uh, very give a very uh, a brief overview about the data analytics, uh, and then I'd like to actually give some like you know, introduction to the machine learning, and then I'll jump into the basically the major topic, which is the data science workflow of the computational pathology. Okay, so uh, let's see what is data analytics. So data analytics is mainly usually is referred to as studying the past of the data. Uh, it, it examples includes like an audio, image, video, finance, inference data like from the online, like you know, from the internet data and so on. Um, usually the way it works that you need to record data, right? You acquire the data re record. And from now on, by the way, I'm gonna actually give more examples in digital and computational pathology because that's the main stream uh, for this presentation. So you have a basically scanner that basically takes the scans of the, you know, the tissue slide, for example. So once you have the digital uh, data, then what you do, you process them, you organize the structures, so dependent, on like what, what kind of categories that you would like to actually uh, acquire the data, you, you organize them. Uh, usually the data that you ac acquire, they are not all the times the way that you want. So you need to go through some cleaning process. Uh, so fixing some inaccuracies, some bugs, maybe some of the, some of the data are actually, um, are, not, uh, are, are not acquired the way that you want. Uh, and then once you basically organize them well, clean them well, uh, what you would like to do before even like you know, applying any model or algorithm, you what you would like to do is to analyze the uh, the current the existing structure of the data to understand the message contained uh, in, in the data, right? So once you have once you do that, you see that like how much, of, for example, from the categories that you have the scan and so far, then what you do uh, uh, from a data science perspective, uh, you apply some models or algorithms to identify the relationship uh, among the variables that exist in that data to, to basically understand and interpret the data. Uh, well, uh, depending on who's your audience, then you need to communicate properly. You need to report the results in a way that it becomes meaningful for the, uh, for the third party. Okay, uh, so in a very uh, overall view, uh, data science is the, basically the intersection of the three entities. The first one is the uh, there's a computer science and IT department is involved to acquire the data, right? So and um, like it's not only about the, the data, it also like the providing the means to the access to the data, to view the data, to visualize the data. Uh, well, uh, if you're if you're bringing some mathematical and statistical interpretation with that basically digital data, then that is the intersection that creates the machine learning. Um, 
And if you want to actually take further a step and you would like to actually go more and try to see where the science of this uh, the, this data and the mathematics is flowing, you need some domain expertise uh, to bring some a better interpretation to the data, some expert to guide what needs to be developed. So that's why the data science becomes the intersection of these three entities. Okay, so I'm gonna actually uh, move on to the machine learning, just give you a very over, uh, brief overview of the machine learning in the context of computer vision. Well, uh, before we do that, uh, the, uh, there are three main branches of the machine learning. Uh, the main one is the supervised learning. The second one is called the unsupervised learning. And the third one is called the reinforcement learning. Well, supervised learning is usually referred to as to being as the, uh, the, the pipeline that there is an expert there that provides you some expert knowledge on your data. And what you would like to do is to develop a pipeline that it replicates that knowledge. So uh, more or less, there's, let's say, in the context of medical imaging, there's a doctor that it tells you that, like, based on these images, based on these data, uh, we do these, this kind of diagnosis. So that's the knowledge that it pertains in the uh, medical experts, you know, um, field and what you would like to do is to develop a pipeline that given the similar basically input data you want to replicate that process um, the second branch is called the unsupervised learning is usually like you know this is uh, usually happens when you have lack of expert knowledge so there is no supervision because some of the times you know, providing those expert knowledge we call it the labels or tags are very uh, expensive such as medical imaging so what you would like to do using borrowing some basically existing pre-existing tools from machine learning from uh, from computer vision you would like to actually uh, process it process the data to come up with some meaningful interpretation and then see if you can actually use it right so the second these are the applications of the supervised learning by the way so like the classification and regression is the two main topics of the supervised learning and the dimensionality reduction and clustering is the another actually two of the uh, the main branches of the unsupervised learning. And the second, the third one, uh, which is actually the two, the, the two of these are not the focus of our presentation today. It's called the reinforcement learning that uh, this usually happens on the go, such as like you no know, robot navigations that you you do, you, you explore your basically uh, environment, you um, and then you exploit and you try to basically learn how well you do, and then based on that, uh, decide your next action to move on. Okay, so my presentation today is mainly going to revolve around the basically supervised learning. So very brief overview uh, of the supervised learning in the context of computer vision. Uh, the goal is to first that uh, there is a basically, uh, uh, there's a hypothetical knowledge uh, that it contains in the data that we need to actually retrieve them by some expert, like not, not necessarily expert, like say in, in computer vision, it's just like you no know, ordinary people. Uh, there's like you no, know, just uh, very some like you no, know, uh, some some student or even like you no, know, some um, non experts that can sit and then tell you that in these images, for example, these are the uh, you know the uh, the objects that I can see and I can identify what are they. For example, here. There's a dog and there's a lady, right? So imagine if you have a means of finding different objects and then you have a pipeline that can pass every one of these objects and tell you that there's a dog and there's a lady in this image. So what it means that you can actually come up with some context with that image telling that, well, maybe there is a scene that there's a lady actually is a, you know, walking with her dog and then like, well, come up with some meaningful in interpretation of the data. Um, so, uh, the, the, basically, the goal is to give me some data so I, I as an expert, basically, uh, you know, knowledge or model, uh, will tell you what are they. Uh, and then the, once you get those tags and labels, then what you try, you try to basically train a model to, to learn that data representation. Okay, so everything starts with, uh, with data in supervised machine learning. Um, I'm going to give you some like a uh, very overview, brief overview ex uh, uh, example from the general computer vision. Uh, it's the ImageNet actually data that has been uh, uh, on the field for uh, almost getting close to a decade. And it's uh, like the whole basically this hype of this deep learning and 
convolutional neural network are built are built in the around this basically huge humongous data. So um, the whole like no, it, when you want to compile a data in computer vision, what you do, you first you would like to define your the categories that you would like to compile. What I mean by that is that you identify the objects that you would like to recognize at the end of your development. So, well, uh, obviously, the more class you have, then you have a better basically dividing your space, your feature space, and like a better represent them, better learn them. And uh, of course, the more samples you have per category, you have a better, like a more complex representation. So you can better learn the representation of your data. For example, the ImageNet, which is known as also the ISLR VRC 2012, has 1,000 categories of image objects. And from each category, there's 1,000 samples. So that's why this, it makes it actually very interesting data to work on, to develop your machine learning models, the pipelines, to, go, to come up with some, you know, like the decision-making algorithms. Well, um, coming up with those tags and labels is not a, an easy task. In fact, the, uh, the, ma the major, one of the major steps to accomplish this kind of data compilation is for you is to hire labelers. Um, let's say some students, uh, they need to familiarize uh, themselves with those class of objects that you predefined them in the before, such as, let's say that I'm gonna, I want to learn the dog representation, uh, you know, the drill representation, the car representation, and so on, right? So what you need to do, you need to actually get get record all those data and you start to give it to basically your expert, and then they would like to tag and label and then tell you that what are they. So once you have those metadata, you have a, the recorded images with the labels. Now you're ready to basically uh, to to uh, to develop your machine learning model. Okay, um, so for example, like for the past 10 years, like eight, 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 nine years, that what is happening that there is di there are different uh, um, a variety of, like there's a variety of basically uh, models in deep learning that has been developed uh, around the image net that they, they, they train on the image net and they come up with uh, certain accuracies or complexities uh, toward the rec recognizing these objects. Uh, well, uh, crafting or like, you know, designing these models, it's basically, it's a science for itself that it happens in the, uh, you know, computer science and engineering field. Uh, that is one of basically my interests that I have been uh, like uh, engaged with this for the past few years to come up with a pr appropriate model given with certain data sets. For instance, in computational pathology, you have digital pathology images. Those models are Necessary, the models that has been developed so far are not necessarily optimized for a uh, medical imaging field. What you need to do, you need to design your own and make sure that they fit properly to the data. Okay, so let's say that you have the data set and then you basically uh, design your basically uh, deep learning models such as convolutional neural network. And then what you're doing, basically, uh, you're, you're, represent, you're trying to replicate the process of those labels, right? Like that happens in the, mi in the mind, in the brain of those experts, the labelers. So the input simply is an image and the output is the, uh, the predicted class, right? Um, so for instance, like in, in Google image search, uh, uh, the tab, if you go and like, you know, upload an image, what, what they do, they try to uh, identify different objects and then based on those objects, they pass it to the model and they try to recognize those objects and it will tell you that, for example, a man with a dog, for example, right? Okay, um, there are some fields, uh, specifically the medical imaging or such as uh, satellite imaging as well, that uh, compiling and metadata, those tags and labels from the experts are very expensive. So what you would like to do, you would like to actually get your pre-trained model that has been trained on ordinary computer vision data, and then you get those pre-trained uh, with some circumventing the, uh, you know, some, some of the basically the pipeline, which is, we call it the classifier. Then you have a means of transferring like, you know, some novel images from medical images into some like, you know, let's say barcodes or features. That, that there's a very, uh, so the, the, the beauty of this work is that you can transfer data into a very abstract and meaningful representation. Uh, and then you can do tons of a lot of things, like for example, grouping them, clustering them, and so on. So that kind of like lies in somehow in the vicinity of the unsupervised learning. 
another interesting um, application is that if you have a means of identifying different variety of categories in your data, so it means that if your the compilation of your data is comprehensive enough, then what you can do, you can learn these, basically the ranges, we call it the normal, and then you can interpret the abnormalities that lies outside this range. I'll give you an example. Let's say that you have a truck that it's, you know, you know how the healthy or like the normal truck would look like, but when it gets in an accident, there's a difference in the representation between the accidental truck versus just, you know, the normal truck. So you can actually, through training yourself through that normal representation, uh, whatever comes and you cannot recognize, then you can actually basically interpret as the outlier or basically abnormal, abnormal representation. Um, so that was the basically uh, the example that I told you. Uh, okay, so that was the, uh, the uh, just a brief basically uh, machine learning in the context of computer uh, vision. Now let's move on to computational pathology, which is the main basically part, the bulk part of my presentation here. But before that, I'd like to actually give you a very brief overview of the, uh, the clinical pathology, specifically the tissue preparation. Uh, so let's say that, God forbid, somebody has a cancer that um, they, 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 you know, they, they get referred to some you know, experts in the medical imaging field, such as MRI or um, you know, X-ray, CTS scan, you name it, right? Uh, and, and, and those modalities are not like, you know, highly resoluted enough to tell you that what exactly is happening in the cellularity of, your, uh, of the tissue. Well, they, the doctors, such as like the MRIs, like you no, know, like uh, readers, like you know, the doctors that they expert in MRI, uh, the medical imaging doctors, they will try to basically come up with a diagnosis. But if they cannot come up with the ultimate diagnosis, what happens that they refer that patient to pathology uh, laboratory to the pathologist, and uh, by referring to the pathologist, pathologists will start to actually get the samples from the from from the relevant tissue. Uh, such as let's say breast or like you no know, colon. Uh, and then, so that's called the biopsy process. So they go under the surgery, they take some, you know, some samples from the tissue, they bring it to the pathology laboratory and they prepare the tissue. What means by preparation, tissue goes under uh, several chemical processes. They wash out the, uh, the, you know, the, uh, the, the proteins, a lot of basically redundant stuff from the tissue, such as using uh, like a formalin wash. And then they embed in the paraffin to becomes like as a sausage. And then once you have that paraffin, paraffin block, you, uh, you pass it through microtome and basically it slices that block. And once you have that basically thin layer in a matter of like, let's say five or 10 micron in thickness, then depending on what kind of part, what, what part of the basically the, ce the cellularity or the tissue components that you would like to highlight it, you pass it through different stains. So in fact, there are different stains in the pathology laboratory. They are one of the famous ones is called the hematoxylin neosin. That is like, this, it consumes more than 90% of the workflow of the pathology. So after that, you, you get the, basically the tissue, you mount it on the glass slide, you put a cover slip, and there you go. You have a basically a glass slide of one by three inch for as a, uh, in a tissue specimen, and it's ready to be basically observed or basically diagnosed. Well, the conventional way of doing that is, well, like, you know, like depending on from which primary organ site that it's coming from, uh, the pathologist will go and like, you know, take the biopsy as we mentioned. Uh, and then depending on, um, you know, like, uh, like the classical way, I'm sorry, the classical way of doing it is that you, they mounted on the optical microscopy that has, this has been the convention for more than 130, 140 years now. And then depending on like you no know, different magnification level on which like you no know, zoom optic zooming that you would like to diagnose your tissue, you can zoom in and then you can navigate through the tissue and come up with the uh, basically the ultimate diagnosis. Well, that's called the you know optical microscopy and like in in the clinical uh, pathology and in the office of every pathologist, you will see it definitely an optical microscopy for sure. Okay, well, the digital pathology is the digitized process, uh, the processing of the optical microscopy. So instead of an optical microscopy, there's a scanner that you actually mount in that, those slides. And then at the end of the day, there's a di it, it digitizes those images and it uh, shows that on the monitor. So instead of the binocular, you will basically hover over 
uh, the, uh, the monitor, you can zoom in, you can zoom out to see basically different structures as an overall view or like even more and so on, right? Um, usually these images are stacked in a pyramid level, meaning that you know they, they get scanned in the raw, in the like the high res resoluted image. Uh, for instance, in the 40X magnification rate uh, at quarter of micron per pixel resolution from one centimeter by one centimeter tissue, you will end up collecting around five gigabyte data uncompressed. So imagine that like, you know, in like, you know, and usually the tissues are, they consume around like one by three centimeter tissue at each slide. And then there are several hundreds to thousands of slides that flow every day in a pathology laboratory. So you can imagine how uh, enormous that the, 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 digit, the, the digital data is. Uh, so we need a basically a proper image management system that it needs to be integrated into the departments to basically you know, communicate across different pathologists for the diagnosis. Okay, I'll give you some like you know hints and overview like this insight toward the scanners. Usually, what ha what what is it? It's just a similar replication of the optical microscopy with the digital you know uh, com uh, you know complements with the digital workflow for acquisition. So there's a light condenser that actually sits beside the you know under the stage. This stage contains the tissue slide, right? And then the condenser's job is to basically make the light you know the illumination parallel. And then it passes through the basically the tissue, there's an objective lens. When we call it, for example, the 40X or 20X or 10X, that will basically determine how high resoluted your basically magnification would be. And then there's a tube lens, right? Like the, which is the second lens. There's a mirror camera that be, because of, you cannot just basically go like, you know, have your scanner like in one meter. So you want to actually just like uh, to, to, to make it an efficient in size, they basically break down the light and you know, like the, there's a mirror that passes through the tube lens and there's a, you know, this is the optical axis. And then there's a digital camera that basically observes or acquire that, uh, that, that image. So more or less, that's, that's what it is. And there's a lot of basically acquisition processes or algorithms are involved to acquire these images. The tissues itself are not flat. They're in fact, they are three dimensional structures. Think of it as a train. Uh, and and then because of that, the uh, uh, you know the, depending on what is your optical uh, uh, zooming level is uh, uh, the, the optic uh, it's called the optical length. Uh, so 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 depending on in what basically a level you are and what is your tissue's elevation is, you need to actually adjust your elevation so um, uh, so to make it basically properly zoomed. So all your images needs to be, uh, you know, like, you know, in, 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 in focus. And it's very basically um, common that sometimes that the tissues, the digital images will be scanned and out of focus. And you need to repeat the process to make sure that the quality of the basically uh, the images are maintained. Uh, well, uh, there's, a, uh, there's another concept in the digital pathology field called the high throughput scanners. It means that you can actually feed in let's say 400 slides of one by three uh, inch, and then uh, the, in a matter of basically half a day or like, you know, even less, uh, like eight hours, like uh, seven hours, the, the task is to, uh, to scan all of these slides and then make it ready for diagnosis in the department, in the pathology department. Okay, so let's say that we had uh, basically the tissue selected by the pathologist. Uh, like what I'm gonna actually do is basically go through a workflow. This is the basically, we call it the data science of the computational pathology. So we started with the slide, uh, then we pass it to the ID department to, to scan those tissues. And once you scan them and you have the digital image, we call it the whole slide image. WSI is a very common term in digital pathology. Uh, and, and, and as we said, this is a humongous amount of data that you, that, you know, record at the end of the day. For example, this breast tissue here, uh, you're looking at around like 100,000 by 120,000 pixel image. So it means that if you just focus in, you will see like a very, um, uh, the, the, just a very frac small fraction of the tissue is, lo looks like something around like, you know, maybe like 1,000 by uh, 1,200 pixel image. So we call it a patch level. So um, the cognitive workload of the pathologist is, is actually is uh, very uh, staggering in the sense that they need to sit 
And every day there are like, you know, 70 or to 100 cases. Each case contains one to eight slides. So usually they uh, diagnose around 400, 450 slides per day in like in four or four hours five hours. So they need to be very well focused, go hover over the basically the tissue, make sure that everything is normal. If it's not, then you know they flag it and they try to basically uh, perform the diagnosis, right? Well, this is a very uh, uh, time consuming and also the, the error that it involves due to the fatigue of the, uh, uh, of the pathologist is uh, actually is a flagging uh, issue. So what we uh, so the purpose of the computational pathology is to take these digital pathology images and develop a machine learning pipeline so it can replicate the process of diagnosis for pathologists as an assistive tool assistant tool so um obviously as we said that because we live, we we're, uh, we we uh, we live in the context of the supervised learning for computational pathology mainly so our experts are not just ordinary people they are like medical doctors it's they are in fact the pathologists and they need to annotate the data to develop that basically machine learning pipeline so what it means that we pass the images in different you know uh, levels such as you know patch level or the region of interest level a slide level for them to annotate for us and tell what exactly they see on these slides. And we will use them for the development of the machine learning. So this is, for example, is the ROI level uh, that the pathologist has tagged. Yeah, this is a normal colon tissue, but these are actually abnormal colon tissues. And they can actually even give us more diagnosis information, such as like, you know, what is the grade of the tumor that they are seeing and such as, and such, uh, and such as on. Uh, and or you can actually pass the like instead of the ROI level, the region of interest level, you can actually just crop a patch, a pre pre predetermined size, which is actually my project, that we pass it to the pathologist and we tell them, tell me what you're exactly seeing in this e in this image. And we, in fact, we have a taxonomy that has been vetted by the pathologist. So they will go and like you know on the patch level, they try to not to leave anything behind and tell us what they see. For example. Uh, I see a blood cells, I, I see connected tissues, like you know, epithelial cells, or what kind of epithelials, and so on. So, okay, so once you have those metadata, then you're ready to develop your machine learning. So uh, we had the raw images, and then we had the metadata, which we call it the annotated labels, right? Now we have the means to develop our machine learning pipeline. Uh, so one of my interests in, in this project is to develop a machine learning pipeline, specifically com uh, convolutional neural network, that fits the purpose of the computational pathology in terms of accuracy and speed. Uh, majority of the basically uh, the deep learning models in general computer vision data, they are very uh, compre they, they, they are very complex and uh, you know in terms of handling the, the model, um, uh, usually like you know in pathology images with respect to those whole slide images, from every whole slide image, you will end up co collecting around 5,000 image patches. And imagine that you have several hundreds of those slides and you need to actually just you know, pass it to the AI and do the basically diagnosis. So your AI model needs to be fast enough and accurate enough to basically to come up with those ultimate diagnosis. Okay, so once you have that engine that replicates the process of basically uh, you know, the medical diagnosis similar as to the pathologist, then what we do with consultation with the pathology, we come up with a computer aided diagnosis. Uh, system because that engine itself it's meaningful for computer scientists but for as an end user they have no clue what that is all they want to see how these engines could be used so depending on what is the uh, you know the uh, the requirement of the pathologists are they will use that those engines such as you know like they pass it through different areas of the uh, the slide and they come up with uh, you know certain heat maps telling that uh, these are the normal areas, for instance, these are abnormal areas, or you can actually uh, use it for educational purposes. Then, uh, you know, like for, for the pathology residences, you can pass the whole slide image, and then the machine will, like the AI, will tell you that I see, uh, you know, certain tissue types, like such as, you know, connective uh, tissues here, uh, or like, you know, epithelial steel he uh, here, and so on, the blood cells, the transport vessel, and so on, the nerve tissues, and so on. Uh, so, depending on what is the end application is, there is a thorough consultation that design that it involves here. It's called the CAD, as I said. And then what we do, once you design that, 
because the end goal is to use this in a clinical application, you need to properly evaluate that. So now basically the repla the, there's a uh, replacement between the pathologist and the computer science here. As you can see that the pathologists are directly involved in evaluating that pipeline and giving a feedback to the basically the, the, the beginning in terms of the data compilation, telling that, let's say, for, I'll give you an example. Let's say that we are, the purpose is to develop a cancer, uh, cancer detection on the breast tissues, right? So depending on how well, on, in what granularity level of, uh, you know, the data has been compiled for labeling and annotation, you might basically not compile some classes less than the other, right? And then the pathologist will basically evaluate that cat and depending on the, uh, uh, the accuracy level, uh, if the accuracy level of a certain class is low, then they will give us feedback telling us that, hey, you need to compile more of these in your basically pipeline. So what it means that they need to re-engage with us, annotate again, and basically repeat the process. So the whole process repeats until we basically observe a uh, stable platform for, um, uh, for, for the CAT system that can be integrated into the uh, clinical pathology for, for, as an assistive tool for pathologists as a, so, so as to help them to facilitate, to expedite the process. So this is the ultimate goal of the computational pathology. And it's still like, you no, know, there's a, a lot of researchers are basically revolving around this basically, uh, you know, topic, and they're trying to come up with, a, you know, certain um, uh, applications and, you know, uh, the, and, 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 and uh, uh, pipeline developments. Okay, so the, as, 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 as we said, everything starts with the data. Uh, as part of my project, we have started a, a, a new concept in computational pathology. We call it the Atlas of Digital Pathology. Uh, but before that, uh, I'd like to actually give just like the, uh, just to want to flash back with that image net. And if you remember that, uh, we said that the more number of classes or the categories you compile, the better representation that you can come with that application. Well, if, unfortunately, that's not the case with computational pathology. Because of the regulations in medicine and the pathology department, uh, the, and also the expensive, like the, uh, the, the expensive process of data annotation, usually what happens in co computational pathology, we end up collecting very few limited number of classes for development of our deep learning models. And, and this means that, for example, if we if you're collaborating with a you know GI specialist, the gastrointestinal specialist, usually they would like to develop a pipeline that uh, detects the uh, the normal classes or detect detect the cancer in colon versus uh, from normal versus uh, you know abnormal. Or uh, like if you move on to the breast, then you need to repeat the process. So from a machine learning perspective, uh, what we are thinking this is redundant. This is not actually. Um, the proper way of developing these kind of annotation, annotations, the data compilations. So what we what we do, like what we did, we start to think that what is like really is happening in pathology medicine because to, in order to come uh, to come up with uh, good ideas that could be useful for the pathology, you need to first and go consult with pathologists. So we uh, we started the, our collaboration like you know, a couple of years ago in St. Michael Hospital, and now actually we're extending our collaboration with. Kingston General Hospital and Queen's University uh, with few pathologists. And we uh, started to say that, okay, so what's really happening in pathology? How the resident pathology becomes a, an expert, let's say in certain fields such as GI, gastrointestinal field to, you know, to detect, you know, to, to start to diagnose cancers. So, well, there is a process to that. So what happens is um, the pathology residences, they start to get familiar, they familiarize themselves to the uh, comprehensive histology uh, of, of, the of, of the tissues, you know, which are, they are normal, healthy. So they start to learn first the healthy range of the different tissue types. Uh, so in fact, this is the case when you go to the pathology medicine, the curriculum, there's, there's a lot of tons of basically Atlas textbooks. They start to, you know, familiarize themselves with the different presentations visual presentations of tissue types. So what we did, um, we start, we structured a new uh, taxonomy for, uh, for the histology, atla, uh, for histology uh, from the histology textbooks uh, in a sense that it fits the purpose of machine learning 
development for computational pathology, where it starts with the nine level of the high, high level, basically uh, tissue types, such as, you know, epithelial, connective proper, blood, skeletal, adipose, nervous, and glandular. And then based on every one of these categories, they subcategorize, and then they sub subcategorize. So we have a third level of hierarchy that they can decompose and to the, uh, you know, we identify to the granularity of the tissue types what, what exists on small region of image, which we call it a patch. So in fact, on the, uh, on, on the third, like uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the third level of the hierarchy, we have identified 36 histological tissue types. We call it the HTTs. And, uh, and, and the interesting thing about this data set is that given an image patch, there is more than one HTT has been labeled uh, by pathologists. We have compiled around 18,000 patches, and we use these patches to develop the, basically a pipeline, a machine learning pipeline. Now it actually it's ready to replicate the process of just classifying normal tissues. And why this is important, because we're not actually doing cancer right in the beginning, uh, it becomes important uh, uh, moving from one organ to another. Because we have a unified uh, taxonomy, depending on what basically uh, organ you're looking at, there are few basically HTTs that they are diagnostically relevant to identify the cancers. So to, to basically to classify cancers. For example, if you're a pathologist and you're dealing with the colon for cancer detection, what mainly they do, they concentrate on the epithelials, specifically simple uh, cuboidal epithelial and simple columnar epithelial as well as the lymphocytes from the, bell, uh, the blood cell categories. So depending on the population of these you know, visuals and the morphology of these tissue types, they will identify whether this colon tissue is healthy colon or cancerous colon. And if you move on to, let's say the breast, there are other HDTs are involved to, to, for their ultimate diagnosis. So using this process, what we did, we. Um, uh, we developed as a proof of concept, which has been published, uh, the, uh, you know, this year in uh, European Conference in Computer Vision, that uh, using these manual, basically, uh, rules that is being given from the pathologist, because you know the primary organ site, you know the, where the tissue is coming from, we have been able to identify cancerous tissues from normal tissues without learning the representation of the cancer. And this is very unprecedented. And because of that, it makes it like many basically pathologists, many actually computational pathology or machine learning experts attracted to this work. Well, uh, uh, the huge part of this uh, project involves with the data annotation. Uh, so what we have done, we have designed an online web annotation that we have a server, we have tons of basically uh, patches that has been coming from different organ sites. And then we pass it to, uh, like, you know, to, to uh, as, as an online platform. So the pathologists from different institutions, from different locations, physical locations, they can log into this website. They can start to annotate these basically patches, and they, they can get, help us in compiling more and more uh, clinically validated data. Um, and and we and, and the same process is involved for the uh, you know for the disease the slides as well. So the next step is that okay now you have a means of developing a pipeline a machine learning pipeline that it can replicate that those healthy stuff and you have also means of detecting cancerous with the lack of let's say confidence predictions of those uh, relevant components. Then what happens that if you want to validate your pipeline. Uh, you, what you need to do, you need to pass the whole slide images that they are diseased, such as you know, cancer, but breast cancer. And uh, the pathologist will start to annotate on the tissue level and say that these are like, for example, are the tumorous areas. And then we go to these areas, we uh, crop like you no know, small image of field of view images, the patches, we pass it to our pipeline to come up with those evaluation protocols to see how well our pipeline has learned to identify these cancer versus health, uh, like cancerous versus healthy uh, tissues. Okay, uh, the and, I, and I'm going to move on to the machine learning development in computational pathology. Um, uh, we have done a survey uh, this uh, past summer across uh, almost uh, 350 papers, and we have identified how the community of the computational pathology is evolving. Um, 
uh, as you can see that because of the importance of the different organs, like, you know, the breast cancer is one of the, uh, you know, the popular cancers in the world. And after that is the, uh, the GI, is a colorectal cancer. And depend and, and depending on these, basically the pie, uh, the, uh, the area, you will see the importance of these organ sites. And then, uh, you know, uh, depending on these organ applications, uh, there are different tasks are involved for as a cap design. So what I mean by that is, uh, so what, what is the task that the machine learning wants to develop and brings it as a useful pipeline for pathologists? Uh, there are different, uh, you know, applications could be developed in computational pathology, such as detection, detecting cancer use versus your positive or negative cases. Um, uh, you can actually classify on the tissue subtype level you can, uh, you, you can actually diagnose or classify different cancer grades, uh, such as, you know, in breast cancer, it's called a normal, benign, in situ, and carcinoma cancer, um, and, and, and so on. You can even actually go and segment the cancerous areas on the whole slide image and show it to the pathologist, and they will, you know, they can, they can, you can help them in navigating through diagnosing, you know, abnormal regions. So depending on what is the, uh, the, the best suit, the best, the best fit, people uh, develop differently. Um, when it comes to the machine learning pipelines, uh, there are a lot of machine learning, the deep learning models that has been used. Uh, these deep learning models are mainly pre-trained model, or pre-designed model that has been designed for the general purpose of the computer vision application. And uh, few has concentrated on tailoring uh, specific models for computational pathology. So this is one of the big areas, the, 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 the uh, highly potential areas uh, that one can actually enter, uh, including myself, that we would like to tailor a model that uh, fast, is fast enough, accurate enough, and it fits the, uh, and better fits the purpose of the computational pathology to, to, to determine, to come up with those task designs. Um, so I, I think we have uh, gone through this. Uh, and, and another actually uh, thing that I actually, uh, uh, and I'm concentrated actually right now is that we are developing, as I told you that the, uh, the, the deep learning models are inefficient, in, inefficient because of the, you know, the lack of the speed and they're complex to handle. So what are we actually trying to do now is to come up with a dynamic scaling uh, algorithms that uh, you know, on the go, you can start to design your architecture. And this fits the, uh, the category of the neural architecture search, which we have just recently uh, submitted a paper to Computer Vision Pattern Recognition Conference just last, last week. Okay, um, and the CAT system, the overall view of the CAT system in pathology, computational pathology, is, looks something like this. So you have the tissue slides, and then you pass it to the whole slide image scanner or digital pathology scanner. And then there is a AI that process in parallel to what the cases has been offered to the pathologist. So the, uh, we call it supervised CAT system. Uh, you can do different things. You can uh, do the slide screening, cancer heat map generation, or cancer classification. And then whatever the report is, you pass it to the pathologist as a confirmation. So pathologists will come up with their, with their own ultimate diagnosis. They check it, what, they check what the AI is telling you, and then they will finalize their clinical report. Uh, so what you need to actually think this part is the aggregation of the data from multiple pathologists around the world. So if you can engage more pathologists from different, you know, institutions, then you're basically um, uh, compiling the knowledge that it pertains from different pathologists. And, and, and the second opinion, asking for second opinion of, in pathology departments is a very, very common thing. A pathologist can actually uh, ask his or her colleague for more than once or twice or three times to basically make sure that the, what they're diagnosing is what they're seeing, like what they're seeing and what they're diagnosing is correct. Um, in fact, if I give you an example, there are a couple of ex studies that has uh, been conducted in the past that depending on what kind of organ that you're, like the complexity of the organ for diagnosis, the, uh, the same pathologist has been asked to diagnose certain number of cases and then they record the data they ask them to come back several months later. They give them exactly the same, basically, cases. And uh, the, the intervariability of, like, you know, uh, for, for, their, for their diagnosis, it, uh, the accuracy is around, like, 75%. So what it means that 
is common to misdiagnose from the same pathologies from one time to another, depending on like, you know, how fatigued they are, how, you know, like focused are they, they are and like, you know, on, the, on their moods. So developing some uh, CAT system to help the pathology department is very, very important. And uh, the overall view of the integration of the computational pathology in like, you know, laboratory medicine, uh, the, you know, the future would look something like this. So you have a, you know, the patient goes to the hospital, uh, they get referred to pathology laboratory, like they take tissues, they send it to the pathology laboratories, uh, you scan them uh, through, you know, the digitization process, then you, you archive it. You can pass it to directly to the pathologist. They will actually investigate themselves on the monitors as a basically virtual microscopy. Uh, and at the same time, you can pass it to your AI model uh, to do some, you know, like, you know, diagnostics on it, such as, you know, triaging the cases for pathologists. Depending on, you know, the in the early morning compared to the afternoon, the pathologist's mind is very fresh. So if you can actually triage the cases and tell them that, hey, diagnose these slides rather than those normal looking slides, you can actually save a lot of time. Actually, the accuracy was going to actually uh, uh, rise high. Or you can actually do further. You can pass it to your AI. They can actually uh, process it themselves come up with uh, with some diagnosis you know results and then you can aggregate all these to the uh, to, to the ultimate uh, diagnosis for the pathology to come up with that final report and then the final report gets back to the pathology laboratory and then they communicate to the hospital and the hospital basically contacts the patient for the results uh, some examples of, of the cat system like for, uh, this is the visual aiding you can actually for educational purposes for example uh, for, path for pathology residences. The slide that you're looking at is around 100,000 by 80,000 pixel. So every one of these dots that you're seeing is an image patch of size 10, 1,000 by 1,000 image pixel. So if you have a means of actually highlighting these specific areas, then you can actually navigate your pathologist through their diagnosis. You can do another, actually, you can do another thing. You can actually segment on the slide level that segment different areas of the slide, telling that these are the adipose areas, these are, you know, the glandular areas, these are connective tissues, and so on. And then the pathologist can actually, you know, go through these se se semantically segmented images and compare them with the original image and see that whether this matches or not right so if it matches so they do the evaluation if it becomes useful then you can they can use it as an assistive tool to guide them in their visual uh, uh, you know aiding uh, you know their, their diagnosis procedure um, there's another work we actually uh, that just I told you about this, this uh, conference paper so uh, uh, that we sub, uh, published this here using our atlas data we came up with a uh, uh, CNN model, the deep learning model that can, uh, without learning the representation of cancerous data, we're able to uh, detect and classify our cancer grades, which is very interesting. Uh, my final uh, part is the clinical validation, and I'm going to go uh, through it, and I'll tell you why this is important. Uh, this, the clinical validation is basically, as I told you, that CAT system that you design, you need to evaluate that. Well, um, if you can, if, you, if the question is how we, how would you like to evaluate it, and what does the evaluation means from a regulatory, uh, you know, uh, regulation, regulatory, uh, you know, the, uh, um, viewpoint, such as FDA uh, in in the U.S. So, uh, in fact, there is no FDA approved for any uh, computational pathology pipeline yet. There are some negotiations. There are some basically uh, some very pre-approved uh, uh, regulatory uh, uh, documents that uh, they engage with different companies around the world, specifically North America. And then uh, they would like to observe what's happening with them. And the, the question is, the ultimate question is, what would the FDA would look like or the regulatorily approved document would look like for clinical AI pathology? So. Uh, as an overall view, but, and, and I'll tell you what, why we're sticking with the supervised learning rather than unsupervised, right in the beginning, the pathologist gets involved in compiling your data. So it means that this is the supervised, this is, this is the supervisor, this is the expert uh, guy that at, right in the beginning, it gets involved in developing the pipeline. And then, as we said, we develop our basically a learning model, such as deep learning model, 
that is done by the, you know, mainly done by the computer scientist. And then you design your computer aided diagnosis system using that uh, learned engine. And then uh, there's an assessment and evaluation is happening the, by the pathologist. And then there's a feedback goes to the basically, uh, you know, the data compilation part. And this process repeats until you get a basically fairly stable platform. And then once everything gets approved, then you have a stable CAD product that you can start to advertise it from a, you know, commercialization point of view. So that's uh, perhaps the way that we, we see uh, as, as our collaborating, uh, as a, from, uh, the way we, we see this, how the FDA is going to look like in future is something like this. And whatever we develop, it needs to be fitted to this purpose in a way that, you know, uh, later on it could be integrated in clinical pathology for diagnosis. And thank you. Awesome, Maddie. Well, thank you for that. That was a really in-depth view of, of all the uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence for digital pathology, which has been really insightful. Um, so we're just wrapping up. If there are any questions right now, I'd love for them to be uh, put in the comments there on either Facebook or YouTube. So um, <clears throat> excuse me, if there are any comments, please free, feel free to ask them right now. Um, Otherwise, um, thank you so much, Maddie, for for coming in and showing us showing us some of your research. I know being part of the UNB community now, uh, it, it's real. It's a really amazing opportunity for our community to see some of the stuff you've been up to and and uh, learning about uh, the uh, digital pathology side of, of of AI and machine learning. So again, thank you so much. Well, thank you, Jade, and I'm looking forward to uh, to to physically join UNB beginning of uh, this January, and I'm looking for basically uh, the future opportunities to see how we can expand this project at UNB. Absolutely. Uh, so on, we don't have any questions right now, but if anyone does have any questions, they can send it to us or contact us uh, on our at the UNB website. So unb.ca/tme and and just go to contact. And if they have any questions, they could forward them to me, and I can get them to you. Uh, as soon as possible. So uh, again, yeah. thank you, Maddie, for uh, joining us. I'm just going to pull you off stage and uh, just do my outro. And again, thank you so much for joining us no today. Worries. Thank you so much and have a good awesome. day. So uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us today for today's RBC Lunch and Learn. Uh, that was Maddie Hosseini, our uh, latest assistant professor here at the J. Herbert Smith Center. Uh, join us next week where we have Abby Pond, uh, CEO and founder of uh, Queen of Cups, uh, a former Summer Institute company. Uh, she will be joining us and talking a bit about her experience as an entrepreneur. And again, if you have any questions for Maddie or if you have uh, any uh, questions about some of the programs that we'll run here at the center, so, uh, please head on over to umb.ca slash TME uh, and you can find out all about what we do there. So thank you for joining us today. <laughs>